Last month, Uber employees turned on their work laptops, logged into the internal Slack chat system, and saw a message which read, I announce I am a hacker and Uber has suffered a data breach. At first, employees responded to this message with funny gifs and memes, until it became apparent that this was not a joke, but Uber had in fact suffered a major compromise on most of their internal systems. I've gone through Uber's press release, as well as some other reports from security researchers and journalists, as well as some information that appears to come from the attacker, and I'm going to go through the sequence of events that led to this compromise today. I'm going to share what happened, Uber's response, how we should judge their response, and what other organizations can do to prevent this type of compromise. Welcome, or welcome back. My name is Eldridge. I've got 10 years of experience between IT and information security, and I'm going to break down the Uber compromise today. The first thing before we dive into the sequence of events is a minor caveat. When you're outside of a compromise, it's almost always impossible to know exactly what happened. Uber's press release, as you might expect, didn't contain a whole bunch of technical information. However, there are multiple reports from multiple sources, and most of them seem to agree on the sequence of events that led to this compromise. And that sequence does seem to align with my experience and how these things tend to happen. So with that caveat out of the way, let's dive in. The first thing that you may have seen in the headlines is that all of this started from a single compromise of a single contractor's credentials. So that's the thing that led to every other thing. So how did that happen? The first thing is that the attacker was able to gain that employee's Uber internal password. No one seems to be entirely sure how exactly this happened. Uber's suggestion is that the attacker bought that password on the dark web. What that probably means, although not necessarily, but probably means that this employee or contractor was using the same password for their internal Uber systems as they were elsewhere in their life. Now, as you may have heard if you talk to security experts, it's strongly recommended that you use unique passwords on each system that you log into. Now, this is practically difficult given how many systems that people log into on a daily basis, but this is where that advice stems from. What likely happened is that this contractor used the same password on their internal Uber system that they did on a probably low stakes system or website. So as just a hypothetical, that's probably similar to what happened. This contractor had an account on a website that was just a forum about something relatively inconsequential and it didn't have the most stringent security. That site was compromised, the database of passwords compiled with others and sold on the dark web. That was somehow linked back to his identity by the purchaser. And then that password was tried against internal corporate accounts at Uber. So what you might do is this might be ties to names or personal email addresses. You can scan those against LinkedIn or other corporate data resources that will share, show where people work. And then you can try that password against an Uber account. Once the attacker had the password, they attempted to log into internal Uber systems using it. Once this happened, it required a second factor of authentication. Now, many of you are probably familiar with second factor or multi-factor authentication. That's when you log in using your primary credential, usually a password, and then you have to do something else too. Most commonly, it's a short code that you text that you type in after getting it texted to you or from an app. There are a few other options, and that's one that Uber is using here. If you're familiar with Google's push two-factor or if you use Duo Security, that is a push uh, multi-factor. What that means is rather than typing in a code, when a, a login attempt is detected, the employee or user's phone who is associated with that account gets a notification. That notification contains some basic information and a yes-no option. Normally that information is something like, Eldridge, you're trying to log into system A using Firefox in New York City. If that's what I'm doing, I hit yes. If it says something like, you're trying to log in using Internet Explorer in London, you would hit no, because that's not me. So this is a little bit easier on usability for people when using two-factor. The downside is this opens them up to what's called MFA bombing. This is when you send so many push notifications to a user's phone that they eventually acquiesce out of annoyance or frustration. And that's exactly what happened here. 
When the attacker was attempting to log into Uber's internal systems, this was pushing notifications to the contractor's phone. Now, to their credit, they did not accept them easily or early. It required additional social engineering on behalf of the attacker. If you haven't heard the term social engineering before, I like to explain it as rather than attempting to compromise the computer, you're attempting to compromise the human. Using manipulation or persuasiveness, you're going to try to get the user to share information they shouldn't share or perform an action that they shouldn't perform. In this case, accepting a multi-factor push when they were not in fact trying to log into a system. So the social engineering that was done here was the attacker reached out to the contractor on WhatsApp, claimed to be from Uber IT, and said that the pushes would keep happening until the contractor accepted the push and hit yes and allowed the login. Now, even then, the contractor appeared to not accept the push, but eventually acquiesced because the attacker was sending so many push notifications to them. Once that push was accepted, the attacker was able to log in to the system they were trying to gain access to, which was Uber's VPN. VPN is a virtual private network. You've probably heard of these if you've listened to any ad on half of the podcasts out there around now. Most commonly for consumers, they are used to change your apparent geography. So a common advertisement for VPNs is, are you in the United States and you want to watch something that's on Netflix in Canada or the United Kingdom? Use our VPN and it will route your traffic through an encrypted tunnel that then comes out in Canada or the UK. And then Netflix or whatever streaming service you're trying to watch will perceive you as coming from the UK or Canada. Now, that's a consumer use case. They're also advertised to consumers as ways to protect your privacy. I personally don't think that's a particularly good use of VPNs. I'm going to have a video coming out about that later on this month. So stay tuned. But in the case of a corporation or an enterprise using VPNs, they use them for different purposes. Most often, it's to have one unified network across multiple buildings or offices or locations. So as an contrived example, you might have a printer at the office that prints over Wi-Fi. You're not on the office Wi-Fi, but you still want to print. You connect to the VPN, and then your laptop thinks you're on that Wi-Fi, and the printer does too, so you can print. Now, imagine that with lots and lots of different services, servers, apps, devices spread across multiple locations, data centers, and remote users using VPNs to access them. So that's the type of thing that Uber was attempting to do with their VPN, most likely, and that's what this attacker accessed, lots of internal services. Now, at that point, they begin just poking around and scanning for internal services. There are scanners you can use. They likely use something like Nmap. That's where you iterate through lots of different things connected to a network, in this case, a virtual private network, mm -hmm. and see what they are offering, what you can connect to. And what they found was a network share for files. If you've ever worked at an office, uh, you probably have had access to something like this. This is, at its ba most basic level, effectively just an external hard drive, but instead of plugging it in through USB, you can only access it over the network. Now, if you're a large corporation like Uber, the external hard drive is probably lots and lots of hard drives across lots of systems and lots of locations, but the principle is the same. So now this attacker with only one purchased credential and one MFA push has access to Uber's entire internal network, at least to access it, and the network share. So the attacker begins investigating what types of information are stored in the network share. And what they find are some PowerShell scripts. Now PowerShell is a language, uh, a programming language or a scripting language that system administrators or other people will use to automate tasks primarily on Windows. So it can be used for a whole bunch of stuff, but most commonly that's its use case. And when you have a script or a program that needs to access other systems, it needs to log in the same as a human does. And normally what happens is in a highly secure environment, you have other systems that are responsible for managing access. When the script needs to access a system, it interfaces with those other uh, credential management systems and only gets access for a limited period of time. Setting that up is a little complex, so if you're trying to do something very quickly or if you don't have the time to invest in one of those systems, what you might do instead is just manually put the password 
in the PowerShell code itself. So then the code will just send the password down the wire as if it was a human doing it. Now, I won't speculate as to why it is the case at Uber, but that is in fact what happened here. The attacker was able to see that PowerShell script, see it was accessing lots of systems, and see the passwords right there written out in the code that it was using to access those systems. So at this point, the attacker is armed with an active connection, the credential of one employee, and now the credentials to log into other systems. And this is where the attacker started being able to get just about anything they wanted. One of the systems that they gained access to using the PowerShell, using the credentials found in PowerShell, was one called uh, Thycotic. Now, Thycotic is a system that manages access to other systems. So it, by its very nature, needs to have very privileged access, ability to do lots of things, to these other systems. Once the attacker had access to Thycotic, they were able to use that to grant themselves access to a lot of the major systems inside Uber. One notable one was Google Workspace. This is Google's apps, but running at your domain. So if you send an email to someone at uber.com, they're going to check it using gmail.com. It'll just be associated with an uber.com email address. So at this point, the attacker had access to all of internal email as well as Google Drive. It had access to Slack, their internal chat and messaging system. They also had access to Google Cloud and Amazon Web Services, both of the cloud offerings from those companies, and that's probably where Uber runs a lot of their servers and data storage. It also gave them access to one login and duo, credential storage and multi-factor systems, gaining them probably even more access more broadly into Uber or into other systems. So at this point, this is a pretty major compromise. They've compromised their internal communications, both email and chat. They've compromised their servers running in Amazon and Google. Uh, they may have other services and servers running elsewhere, but at this point, it's looking like, at this point in the sequence of events, the attacker has just about everything they could possibly want. So at this point, the attacker has access to just about every system they could possibly want. And what they do with that access is send a Slack message to every Uber employee, letting them know that they've been hacked. At this point, that obviously enables Uber to be aware of this hack and start applying mitigations and responses. So let's dive into Uber's responses next. The first thing Uber did was identify which account had been compromised. They didn't share exactly how they did this, but they would have lots of logs and information about the endpoint laptops and phones of their contractors possibly, and most certainly they would have logs of what their authentication systems were doing. And so they could have applied some pretty stringent searches, uh, looked through their logs there to determine which account had been compromised. I don't know exactly how they did that. Off the cuff, one thing that I might think they might look for was, let's see if anyone has been MFA bombed. They might already know that's a weakness and decide to look for that explicitly. They also might look for what accounts are being logged into from unusual locations. Most likely they were just going through their logs, looking for something unusual, and eventually were able to trace the original compromise back to that contractor's account. At that point, they were able to lock that contractor's account and uh, force them to do a password reset so that the attacker was not able to log in using the primary credential again. Uh, they disabled all of the affected internal tools, so they turned off Slack, knowing that that would be something the attacker would continually have access to with lots of information in it, and they didn't want communications to be suspect. So they turned off the communication platform that they knew the attacker had compromised. They also rotated keys. This is basically the server equivalent of changing your password. Typically when servers or services communicate with each other, they use keys instead of password. This is because they use what's called asymmetric cryptography or public key cryptography, something that I am planning on doing a video at some point uh, in the future on. But uh, from this perspective, you can think of it as effectively just doing the server equivalent of resetting a password. We don't know if they got access to it. So out of abundance of caution, we're just gonna reset this, do something new in a state that we know is, or we hopefully know uh, has not been compromised. They also locked down their code base. So when anyone wants to add new code to Uber source code, they have to commit it to the code base. During this time, they were not allowing any commits to the code base. 
this was uh, a good thing to respond to. One thing that attackers will often try to do is leave themselves back doors in case they need to get in after their first method of access was compromised. So there's no evidence I'm aware of that this happened, but hypothetically, had they not locked down their code base, what could have happened was the attacker committing code that would give them permanent access to Uber's internal systems, at least until Uber found that change. So it was definitely a good idea for them to lock down that code base early. So these responses are, are pretty good. Um, the identification of the compromised account, obviously Uber would have liked that to happen before they were able to compromise everything else. But once they were notified of this being a problem, they were able to identify that account fairly quickly, lock it down, lock down other systems, and rotate all the keys. So that was the sequence of events. That's Uber's response. So how do we judge that response? One thing that I like to share from kind of the information security community is it's pretty rare for us to dunk on a company or organization just because they've been hacked. Lots of systems interact in lots of different ways and the bigger an organization is, the more technology they have, the broader their attack surface. A company like Uber's attack surface is huge. And uh, just to refresh from my last video, attack surface is it's exactly what it sounds like. It's the amount of surface the company has that could be attacked. If you're running one piece of software and then you run another piece of software, now I can compromise both pieces of software instead of just one. So you've broadened your attack surface. That's not necessarily a thing you can avoid because when you're trying to use technology, you have to use things. So Uber being a huge company with lots of services and lots of apps and lots of integrations all over the world, by its very nature has a huge attack surface. So in cybersecurity, we try not to dunk on folks for getting hacked because it's a large attack surface and there's lots of attackers out there. It's not that unusual to have some compromise in your systems. What is important to pay attention to is how those systems were compromised, what types of defenses should have been in place that maybe weren't or were in place poorly, and how fast and effective was the response to mitigate the compromise after that happened. So I'm gonna do this a little bit backwards. I'm gonna talk about the response first. Uh, I kind of did just a minute ago. The, the summary is it's, it's pretty decent. Um, once you've been compromised in a, in a way such as this, where the attacker has credentials and has access to lots of things, the first thing you're going to want to do is exactly what you'd expect. Lock down all of the accounts that you know that the attacker had access to and lock down any account that they possibly could have gained access to once you do that, rotate all of the passwords and keys so that any access that they gained or any credentials they stole, they are not able to reuse going forward. And so that's kind of the first thing you need to do. And Uber seems to have done that properly. The thing that is always very difficult and will be a challenge uh, forever, I would imagine, is that at that point, you then have to go back and examine every system that the attacker touched or could have touched to see if they left any back doors. Now, thankfully, the Uber response seemed to be fairly quick. So while the attacker was able to gain access to lots of systems, it's unclear how much they were actually able to change in those systems. So best of luck to Uber's security team. Hopefully that was not a huge thing they needed to run down, but it is always a challenge because the amount of backdoors there could be and the ways that you could implement them, it, it's, it's a lot. So. The response was relatively basic, but basic was exactly what was needed, so good job there. And then the ongoing challenge will be seeing what backdoors were uh, implemented, if any. Hopefully none. Now, the first part, which is how did they get hacked, is something that is, is maybe not the best. And that's something that I would want to fix if I was uh, responsible for remediating this for Uber. So. Security engineers tend to think in systems. The question is not necessarily, how did this one user get compromised? Because with thousands or, or tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands of employees and accounts, it's inevitable that at least one of them is going to get compromised at some point. So the approach security engineers try to take is not to just prevent that original compromise, although we do, but to make sure that if any single point of a large company or organization is compromised, that doesn't necessarily mean that they can gain access to other things. 
And that's where I think Uber kind of dropped the ball on this one. The, the most egregious part of this was in the PowerShell script, having a password not only to another huge Uber system, but to a system that would in turn grant access to basically every system inside Uber. Now, like I mentioned when I was talking about the PowerShell script, it's always very tempting to put the passwords and the credentials directly in the script because it's very easy. You don't have to set it up to talk with other more secure systems. And so if you're doing a first pass or a first draft of a particular piece of code or software, that's sometimes what people will do. Now let's go to the actual compromise itself. This is where I, I don't think Uber has quite as good of a showing. Security engineers, we tend to think in systems so that a large organization such as Uber has tens or hundreds or thousands of systems and pieces of software operating all throughout their company. And it's important that if any single system or individual is compromised, that it not mean that anything else gets compromised. This is because in an organization the size of Uber, you have ten, tens or hundreds or thousands of accounts. And it's inevitable that one of them is going to be compromised. So security engineering works to prevent that initial compromise, but also works to make the entire orchestration, the entire organization, holistically secure. And so that's what seemed to be a bit weak here. Once the original compromise happened, the internal movement was very fast and very significant. And most significantly was that PowerShell script I mentioned. Inside this piece of code on a random network share is a password that will gain them access to a system that will then gain them access to everything else. Now, when trying to do holistic solutions to these types of problems, it's important to apply both technological and cultural solutions. And that's probably what didn't happen here preemptively. And I don't know exactly what happened inside Uber. I've never worked there. I don't know many people who do, so I'm not familiar with the culture. However, passwords being stored in plain text like that in a network share often come from two things happening simultaneously. One is that speed is prioritized over safety. This is something that happens in a lot of companies, unfortunately, and it just means that in attempting to get something done, you'll attempt to get it done cutting any quarter you can rather than in the safest way possible. And it's always, always easier to just copy and paste your password right into the script rather than integrating with other systems that could help you handle that more securely. Now, it might be for speed reasons. I think that seems plausible given Uber's culture, what we know of it uh, in the public. But it's also sometimes the case that a more junior engineer or someone who might be particularly advanced in one area doesn't necessarily think about credential storage. And so this may have been, rather than someone cutting quarters, may have been someone just not familiar with the best way to approach this problem. And so this is where thinking of the system holistically and applying technological solutions comes in. Oftentimes when you have code, you will have scanners that run through your code seeing if there's anything in there that looks like a credential. And then it will alert people to rotate that credential and alert the person who wrote the code that you need to do something else. So that typically happens when code is checked into a code repository where code lives. This seems to be just a random file on a network share. It might have also been checked into a code repository somewhere. However, we don't know for sure, so any scanners that would be running against code repos might not be running against this particular script. There are other tools you can use to try and scan for those types of things across things like network shares. There's also things you could write yourself if you're a company with the resources of Uber. But it appears that either they didn't use that tooling or that tooling was not tuned well enough to find this credential. So one or both of those things almost certainly was true. Either the culture encouraged speed over safety, or they did not have the proper tools running to check these things after the fact. And so this is kind of, again, what I was mentioning earlier. If there is a single compromise, in this case, not necessarily a compromise, but an engineer making a less than great decision about credential storage, that should not lead to compromises all over the organization, which is, which is what happened. So 
this is kind of a bit of a strange, strange one. Uber's response was particularly good, but their preemptive preventative measures were not that great. So how should we judge them from the outside? I would say this is maybe a little worse than average for a major tech company, but not a significant atrocity. Now, what will be alarming is if we see a similar attack happen and succeed against Uber again. A huge thing is companies should be able to learn how to secure their systems after they've been compromised in a similar way. And while another compromise may happen, one of the most damning things a company can do, in my opinion, is be compromised the same way multiple times. Now, if they were asking me the best ways to remediate this, one of the most significant and easy things they could do would be to roll out hardware-backed authentication. And if this is something you're looking at for your company or you're worried about, that is what I'd probably recommend. So that is when instead of using a multi-factor code, you use USB keys like this, or you use the biometrics on your phone or laptop. That uses a much more secure, theoretically fish-proof protocol. And so that would have prevented the original compromise. It would have prevented the MFA bombing from ever have worked. The attacker would have had the password. And then when attempting to log in, they would have needed to have this key with them. Uh, not this key, this would get them into my Gmail, but they would have needed to have that employee's key to be able to log in. Now, these keys are not perfect. There are still things that, uh, there are still compromises possible if you're using these keys, but they reduce the ability of attackers to fish your employees by huge, huge amounts. Not only that, but I would also recommend what I mentioned earlier about the tooling scanning for credentials in code. If this code was not checked in and so the tools never got exposed to it, I'd recommend looking at how that might be done. If it was checked in, but the tools failed to find it, then that's something else I would recommend tuning those tools. But at the end of the day, the way to make this not as easy of a compromise in the future is fairly straightforward. If Uber dedicates the resources to it, they should be able to get that improved relatively easy and quickly. So. While I would give Uber a grade of maybe like a C minus on security from this situation, uh, if they were to have a similar compromise again, particularly around MFA bombing, that would drop to an F pretty quickly. So that's my analysis of the Uber compromise, what happened, what their response was like. And I'm gonna be diving in a little bit more to some of the detailed topics I mentioned in here, particularly multi-factor hardware authentication. Uh, which you may know as FIDO or WebAuthn. Also public key or asymmetric cryptography, the way that services talk to each other. Also the way that HTTPS works to secure your websites and apps. Uh, and other videos will be coming out soon on some of the security things that companies are using that are, I just think are interesting or that you can use to make your life more secure. So lots more coming your way. If you like this video or wanna see some ones that I've got coming down the pike, please remember to, um, Psych and Lubscribe.